Well, it sounds like we will form a new squadron. Squadron F, its initial uh, number. A couple of days later, it was given the official number of number 617. 617 squadron was to be led by a wing commander, Guy Gibson. Now, Gibson, at that time, was about to had just completed his third operational tour. At the time, the operational tour on Mars was 30 missions. He, interestingly, is second to the <coughs> mission. Now, here's a slight diversion for you from the, from the story of the Lancaster. Um, Gibson was age 24 when he was promoted to the wing commander. I joined the Royal Air Force at the age of 19. I was then 38 before I was promoted to wing commander, and my promotions were not slow. But it just demonstrates the difference between wartime service and peacetime. We put responsibilities on young shoulders as long as you think they can cope. Those crews were pulled from squadrons all over Bombardier. They were all the new squadrons. They weren't told what the target was. They were told it was going to be at night over water, and that was what they had to practice: low-level at night over water. And they did with great delight. Hundreds of low-flying complaints from the local police poured into Gibson's office. He laughed at all of them through the They did think it might actually be the Turpins. And the Turpins was a German battleship, a big ship, which was moored in a field in Norway and was a threat to the Arctic continent. The crews were told in two days before the car the mission to watch the target. <coughs> Um, the mission itself was to be flown in three waves. Gibson would lead the way for nine aircraft against the Mona and the Abraham. Flight Lieutenant Mick McCarthy would lead a second wave of five aircraft against the Sorbadam. McCarthy is an interesting character, by the way. He was an American who had joined the Canadian Air Force before America joined the war, and here he was flying Lancaster to the Royal the third wave were an airborne reserve, designed to fill in wherever it was necessary. Eight of Gibson's nine aeroplanes reached the Moma Dam. Gibson immediately flew in, low level, 60 feet, attacked the dam, dropped his bomb, it bounced. It hit the wall, but it bounced back very slightly. Sank, exploded, didn't reach the wall. The second aircraft in was flown by Flight Lieutenant Popgood, Poppy Popgood. Hopgood was the best Lancaster pilot the RAF had. He taught Gibson how to fly the Lancaster. Now, it is still unclear what happened, but whatever the cause, whether his aircraft was damaged by ground fire on the way to the target, or whether it was hit by anti-aircraft fire from the roof of the dam, Hopgood's bomb was dropped late, and it bounced over the face of the dam. It exploded on a power station the other side, completely destroying the power station, but unfortunately it exploded directly underneath Hopgood's aircraft. And only three of the crew managed to get out before it crashed. So the third one in was squad in Mickey Martin. Now as Martin flew in, Gibson flew alongside him, flashing those spotlights I heard you told you about and firing all his available guns at the defences on the dam. So they didn't know which of those two aeroplanes was the biggest threat. Martin's bomb dropped, bounced, went slightly off course, and exploded in the dam. It took three more attempts before the dam was breached, and on each of those attempts, <coughs> on each of those attempts, Gibson and then Martin flew alongside the attacking aircraft. Slightly different heights, lights flashing, guns firing, so they didn't know where the threat was. Gibson then took the remaining aircraft to the Able Dam and took all three of those remaining bombs to destroy the Able Dam. McCarthy was the only one of his five aircraft that reached the Sorka Dam. He was joined by two aircraft from the Able Reserve. Now the attack on the Sorka Dam was slightly different. For a start, the bomb wasn't rotating because of the design of the dam. And the other thing was they actually bombed parallel to the paper. All those bombs hit, there was some slight damage done to the parapet, but the dam itself wasn't. The raid was felt to be a success. 
not all of those aircraft that failed to get to the sword of that have been brought down by enemy fire. Alan also said Jeff Rice was flying his aircraft across the North Blue Dutch coast on the way from the target. What he thought was 100 feet of his aircraft peaked the North Sea. The bomb was ripped off the underneath of the aeroplane, the fuselage was damaged, and tons of North Sea water poured into the field. Rice hauled that aircraft back into the air and all that water cascaded down the fuselage and nearly drowned the rear gun. Rice managed to get that aeroplane and all his crew safely back to Stamford, which says a lot about Rice's flying ability, but says a tremendous amount about the strength of Chadwick's design. Eight out of the 19 aircraft failed to return. 53 out of 133 aircrew were killed. It was a success. success. Production, the dams in the rural valley didn't start again for nearly nine months. But in a side issue, which a lot of people don't often connect to the dams, Adolf Hitler said they were the top priority to be rebuilt. That meant that the, the, the diversion of hundreds of thousands of workers and millions of tons of uh, materials from the Atlantic Wall project. The result was on D-Day, the Atlantic Wall was six months behind the car. In terms of the Victoria Cross, and there were 32 other gallantry medals awarded. He went on to be a bit of a celebrity. He was sent to America on a proper land tour. He went came back, he was told to write a book called Henry Ghost Ahead. But he was desperate to get back on the flying. He wangled his way into an operational trip in March 1944. And during that trip, he was flying a mosquito at the bottom of the bottom. Now, it's still a mystery as to what exactly happened, but whatever happened on the way back from that mission, Mosquito crash, and Gibson and his navigator were killed. 617 Squadron went on to become the RAF Premier Precision Bombing Squadron, and Harris continued. Uh, sorry, Wallace continued to design bigger and bigger bombs. The 12,000-pound tall boy that was used to eventually sink the turpin, and the 22,000-pound Grand Slam. That was an earthquake bomb. You didn't have to be precise. You dropped, you dropped into the ground, buried itself into the ground, and exploded and created an earthquake. It was used against hard to hit targets such as biodomes and new boat planes. Now, I said earlier on, 14,000 pounds is maximum bomb over the Lancaster. Grand Slam, 22,000 pounds, only aircraft you can carry into Lancaster, but to do so, they strip off every bit of unnecessary armament and uh, bits of meat. To the point where, by the time they finished, the Lancaster weighed almost exactly the same as the bomb. Because they've always been 22,000 pounds. Well, you can tell they carried by a Lancaster. Compare that to the maximum bomb load of another iconic aircraft design. And another of Chadwick's design. It's also on display here. Airspace. The Avro Vulcan. Chadwick started the design. Maximum bomb load for Avro Vulcan was 1,000 pounds. Okay? With me so far? Good lad. Right, the people. Look at our life.